Welcome to the Bob Balance HealthCast, episode number 374, the five most common problems in patients with low testosterone. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. There are a lot of doctors available and businesses available that do hormone replacement therapy. And the primary focus of that hormone replacement therapy nationwide tends to be on testosterone and estrogen. Mm -hmm. There are other hormones that need, that you need to be aware of, that you need to track, that you also lose from aging, Mm -hmm. that diminish. Uh, And so if someone approaches your office because they've heard about you Mm -hmm. from whatever source to say, well, I'm interested in HRT, hormone replacement Mm -hmm. therapies. I, I want to do the best I can about aging healthily for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And you make the determination, well, you know what, they need testosterone. Mm-hmm. So you give them testosterone. There are a number of doctors who do that. But you have, in your experience of 15 years mm-hmm. of doing this, you have noticed patterns that as people replace their testosterone and continue to age, mm-hmm. if they don't change their lifestyles or if they have certain genetic uh, sensitivities, mm-hmm. they will develop ancillary problems, other problems, like diabetes is a, is a possibility, mm-hmm. that that occur in, in, and cause problems that the testosterone doesn't fix by itself. Mm-hmm. So you've identified five of the most common issues that you've seen as patterns in people over mm-hmm. the last 15 years of doing hormone replacement therapies. So today we thought we'd talk about those five patterns, the kinds of problems that occur, what you what you would expect a physician that was treating somebody you cared about to mm-hmm. notice and know and do and in response to these issues. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Am I right. understanding? Also, also, people come to me. Th- this is the most common uh, triad of problems that people come initially to me with low testosterone and these five things that I can't, I, I can't just treat the testosterone right. and assume that they're, and, and try to change their lifestyles a little bit at the first visit and assume that they're going to be completely better when it's over. Testosterone makes many of these things better, mm-hmm. but it needs specific treatment as well. So the, the other five problems need specific attention, not just testosterone, because that, that won't last. As we progress in age, the testosterone lasts, but, but these other things will still maybe slower than they would have without testosterone, but they'll still creep up and they'll make people think, well, my testosterone's not working. I don't feel really good. It's, you know, I didn't really get completely better. Well, that's because... It's not completely a testosterone problem. Well, it's like saying we put new tires on your car, but you still have to keep them inflated. <laughs> you still have to check the air and put air in when you need air. But you didn't fix the transmission. Right. So, so, <laughs> so the car's not going to run. We have to do something about <laughs> yeah, that. Right. Yeah, right. So we have, to, we have to fix everything for, for us to get the outcomes that we get. For us, to, we've always dealt with these problems, but I thought it would be a good idea to sp- specifically state what they are. Okay. Well, that, and so people don't feel like, oh my gosh, I've got all that. Yeah. Well, it's like going to the bank and, and you keep taking out money your whole life because you don't feel the outcome of drinking too much, eating too much, not exercising, not taking your supplements, not, you know, not doing, not taking time off for yourself. All of a sudden you got nothing in the bank. And that's what happens. They they come in for testosterone and they need it, but they also need these other things taken care of. So years ago, I had a conversation with my physician at that time about my family history of diabetes. I mean, everybody on both sides for two or three generations has struggled with diabetes. Mm-hmm. And so my doctor and I were talking about what are the odds that I'll become diabetic. Since And that, that was 25 years ago, I guess. Mm-hmm. But since then, 
adult onset diabetes has become an epidemic in America. Yes, and it has for a lot of causes, our food, mm-hmm. nutrition, personal habits, and genetics, all. Mm-hmm. So at that time, we were talking about what I was calling pre-diabetes, because I had mm-hmm. read some, as I have a propensity to do, I go read about it, and then mm-hmm. I go. And that doctor said, there's no such thing. You're either diabetic or you're not. And we use this one uh, lab test that will give us a quantitative number, and you're either in or out of the pool. Is that your approach? You know that's not my approach. I know, I know that, but for for the audience, because like, for you, yeah. for you, when when I looked at your blood work, I didn't look at one thing, right. and um, you had multiple signs that you had insulin resistance, which is pre diabetes, and it does exist. And he was just either uninformed or wasn't updated. Had an agenda, yeah. yeah, or had an agenda that he didn't yeah. want to treat anything and he didn't want to listen to your advice or your own advice about yourself my input certainly so yeah. so one of the things or the most common thing i see with people who need testosterone and come in for that reason is that they are pre-diabetic i mean it's 50 percent of our population and as you get older it gets worse now testosterone makes you a little when you t- get it back it makes you a little less insulin resistant mm-hmm. But that doesn't fix everything. Right. So when I see people who have uh, uh, elevated sugar, but not to 130, not to the diabetic range, they have high triglycerides. They may have a high hemoglobin A1C or not, because that's the test for diabetes or has been. And they have gained weight and they have belly fat and and they don't exercise and they have a high carb diet. That's a setup for becoming a diabetic. And I can't just sit back and watch that happen. So, Or, or as that song says, you're on the highway to hell. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Because all of these symptoms are there and all of these problems are there, even if you don't yet trigger the switch that says, alert, you're diabetic. Right. I mean, I think that many doctors are, are trained, as I was trained, to treat the problem. I was trained to treat postmenopausal bleeding. I was trained to treat fibroids by taking the uterus out. I was, I was trained to right. do that but not until they got to the point where they had to be treated right. and they were a diagnosis so most doctors go oh you're not diabetic and i'm not treating you i'll wait till you're diabetic which to me doesn't sound right because i don't want people to become diabetic you can change things so when people come to me with those symptoms and they have low testosterone of course i replace their testosterone but i also talk to them about diet exercise and the importance of it because the minute you get diabetes, you're at high risk for heart disease, and you're going down this path of sickness, 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 and sickness until you die. So you don't want to go there. I also put them on something to help them with their diet called mm-hmm. metformin. If they um, are already on metformin, I usually increase the dose and then talk to them about their diet, low carbs, six, six feedings a day that are small, um, taking out all the... Um, high carb sugars out of their diet. And then I also follow them up. We follow up when they come in for their testosterone. Then we also test blood tests to see if they're on their way to becoming better or not being insulin resistant anymore. Also check their body composition on a body composition machine called the InBody to see if they've lost fat at the four month visit. So we are looking at what all the signs of diabetes and pre-diabetes, right. and we're looking for a response. If we don't get a response, we do some other things. But you're checking multiple indicators. You're not just checking testosterone in the blood. No. So you're, that, you're looking at all these that's other That's not indicators. enough. My, I wouldn't have a 95% success rate Right. if that's all I if did. You, yes. If all I did was say, oh, your testosterone is low, here's some testosterone, then my success rate would be like everybody else's. Right. But it's because I treat these other things and I'm concerned about what's going to happen next. Right. What's the next step? Testosterone may slow it down a little, but it's not going to keep, if you keep doing the wrong things or don't manage your diet or don't manage your exercise, it's still going to happen down the line. And we don't want you to die of diabetes or some complication thereof heart disease because of diabetes. So insulin resistance and prediabetes is the number one thing that I see in association with low testosterone in this culture. I'm not sure that that's true outside the U.S., but it's true here. It's becoming more true in industrialized countries because systems 
are moving in the direction of mass production of prepared food. People mm-hmm. don't go home. And we have a lot of friends in France who, in the last 30 years, have changed the way they buy groceries and shop mm-hmm. and cook. Uh, and they've become more Americanized, and they just get prepared mo- meals and or go out to eat. Because fast. women work now outside the home. That's and women one of the don't, biggest In France, everyone goes to the store every day, and they get fresh everything. Well, they used to. And less now, and less. Right. women are working, right. like your friends, yeah. and they aren't spending their day preparing a meal. Yeah. So it has changed. Yay for the women, bad for the health, you know, but still it has changed. Yeah. There has to be a different lifestyle way. Lifestyle issues. But that is part of what mm-hmm. you address, lifestyle issues. And there is there are ways to do these things mm-hmm. and still have fresh, whole food and not junk food and not fast food. Yeah. So you can do that. And that's what, what I try to try, try to, yeah, to encourage explain, preach. This is how it works. This is right. out here. Call this number. Go to this website. Mm-hmm. It can happen for you. So the second thing that I usually see is an estrone dominance. Now, these all tie together. They all have to do with one another. But estrone is the old man, old lady estrogen that causes us, causes women to feel old. Their their brain, you know, causes their brains not to work and their breasts to be long and not <laughs> perky and causes belly fat. And um, it it basically, in both women and men, it's a response to testosterone lowering from the ovary or the testes and the uh, estrone goes up from the adrenal to so compensate it's to compensate so it makes us old when our testosterone drops okay so many folks i can just give testosterone to and the estrone will drop okay but there are 20 percent of the population in the u.s have a genetic defect that that doesn't work and so, I, so they're converters so they make their testosterone into estrone yes. instead of suppressing right. the estrone for those people i have to use a drug called arimidex now so some it's one in five that's yeah one in five wow and i see a lot more of them than the general population because right. they see somebody else get some testosterone they're fine they don't have this right. you know so so it usually makes the testosterone not work as well if you don't deal with the estrone mm-hmm. so I take uh, I take the estrone level and the estradiol after the pellets are given to make sure that somebody's not converting into testosterone or that the testosterone was effective in shutting down their estrone. So if not, then we use medication. We use a supplement called DIM, D-I-M, called diindole methane, and we also use um, Arimidex, which is a... Uh, an enzyme blocker that keeps testosterone testosterone and lowers the estrone. So that helps people lose belly fat and all the symptoms of the high estrone. So the, these are tablets or pills that you can take orally. Mm-hmm. They don't and require we can put a shot. It, or, or we can put it in the pellet. So for women, we usually put it in the pellet. Mm-hmm. For men, they the pellets that consist of the arimidex only last four months, and men often have their pellets six months. Right. So it doesn't last the whole time for them. I put them on a pill. Okay. So it's not so, as efficient for men to get it in the pellets. Right. Unless they're getting their pellets every four months, and we have some people that do. Right. So um, so that's the second thing that we see, and and second uh, issue. The third thing that I see mostly in women, but some, some in men, is the is hypothyroidism. There's, there's a lot of reasons for this, but we're in the Midwest, and the Midwest is a um, has a lack of iodine. And so with a lack of iodine comes comes hypothyroidism. But well, for this, those of us who are not doctors, okay. hypothyroid means what? Low thyroid. Low thyroid. You're low thyroid. So, so the symptoms are weight gain, hair loss, your eyebrows out here go away, um, your skin is dry, your hands and feet are swollen or your whole body's swollen. You can't seem to get rid of fluid. Um, it actually is one of those things that makes you depressed, makes you sad. Even if you take an antidepressant, if you don't fix the thyroid, you're not necessarily all better. Um, it, it, it affects every single thing in your body, especially your body temperature. So people who have uh, low thyroids also have cold hands and feet. So I can kind of tell when I shake somebody's hand, you know, 
if initially, if I don't know anything about them or I know their lab, I shake their hand and feel whether they have cold hands. Um, so be careful shaking hands with her. She's thinking, yeah. oh my God, you have low thyroid. Oh my God, you have uh, high blood pressure. Yeah, well, oh, it yeah. goes it goes through my <laughs> goes through my mind really fast. I know. But, but I'm I'm perceiving that's that's what I'm supposed to do yeah. when I'm seeing patients. So so these things plus a low blood pressure and a low heart rate, which people think is really healthy, but when it's from hypothyroidism, it's not. So these are things that come in in my patients, and it hasn't been diagnosed for several reasons. One is that patients' symptoms aren't considered by their doctor. All, if they have all the symptoms of hypothyroidism, but their test looks normal, they won't be treated. And, and the tests are very, uh, they're lacking. They, they are different on a daily basis, which makes sense, but, but they basically test the first step in the thyroid production where it comes right out of the thyroid gland, but there's 12 steps before it makes the cells in your body make heat and burn calories. And that's the, the level we should test, but we don't have a test for that except basal body temperature, your basic temperature as you wake up in the morning. And that should be, if you're just checking your own, that should be, if you're a female, it should be 97.9 or above when you wake up and it's oral temperature. And men should be 98.4. I know it's not 98.6, but 98.4 right. is the lowest it should be. Or you have hypothyroidism because one of those 12 steps between the first one that we measure and making heat in our bodies, something went wrong in there and we can't measure it. So if you don't make heat in your bodies, if your furnace isn't working, you're not burning calories, you're gaining none of fat. the hormones that are running through your bloodstream are activated. Well, none of the enzymes, none enzymes, of the enzymes require heat. So right. that's why we're warm blooded. Our enzymes require us to be warm. So many of the enzymes don't work at all right. under 98 degrees. So people who say, Oh, I've been 96 my whole life. I'm like, that, that could be a lack of iodine right. starting out and then a, then a hypothyroid because the thyroid needs iodine to work, but but it ends up being hypothyroid. And in women, it happens at menarche when they start having periods and then it happens after pregnancy and then the other bump is right at menopause. So that's why I see so it's, women it's right at this time with low thyroid. More common as we age that it, our thyroids begin to become hypo, hypo thyroid. thyroid. Yes, and that's that is, and as people get a lot older, so why don't more doctors treat that? I mean, I don't know that I've ever had a conversation with another physician about thyroid that is as expansive because as the they one don't, I have with you. They don't think it's very common because the test doesn't show it. Yeah. And every year, the the test levels that they consider acceptable get bigger, like a bigger span. Even though the test is much more. Um, is much more, uh, what do you call it? Uh, precise. Precise, that's it. Yeah. Much more precise that they make the levels a bigger range that's normal. Well, that doesn't mean the patients are well. It just means that the average patient <laughs> that they tested, mm -hmm. there's a lot of hypothyroidism and they said it's okay. They aren't looking at symptoms. You have to look at symptoms and then match that to, to the actual uh, blood levels, and it doesn't seem that they're, or they're doing that. they're looking at budget constraints that yeah. tell them we're not going to do treatments outside of these ranges because right. it costs We don't want to spend the money on it. Exactly. But it, it also could have been dealt with. They took iodine out of a lot of things in our in our foods. They mm -hmm. used to give it to us in our foods to, to prevent goiters, and nowadays they don't have it in bread and they don't have it in many other things. Right. It's in salt, but. It's in. We don't usually use iodized salt now. Well, so, and you can thank your federal government for yeah, that. Yeah, and the federal the FDA government sets out food standards for what things have to have in them. So I, I basically have to make up for years of people being hypothyroid and being yeah. overweight and being tired and being depressed. So oftentimes, my patients, because of the testosterone that elevates their mood and thyroid. They can get off antidepressants. We used to test for that before. We would test and look for symptoms of low thyroid before we put anybody on an antidepressant, and they don't do that anymore. Yeah, it was like a one-two step. Right? Yeah. A waltz. So in the media today, there's a lot of stuff that's out there about human growth hormone. Mm -hmm. And the federal government regulatory agencies are pretty aggressive about watching doctors about providing human growth hormone mm -hmm. to people. Uh, 
So your next issue is people that have much too little human growth hormone as they right. age. Right. But it's difficult to just give them human growth hormone. So and that may not always be the answer, too. So, right. um so growth hormone starts decreasing at the same time testosterone starts decreasing. It's kind of a parallel line. Mm -hmm. So as we get older, we have less growth hormone, which means that we don't repair our cells as much. Our brain repair doesn't happen. We don't, that's what makes us old is that we're, we're not, we don't have the cyclic repair of every cell because the growth hormone is what makes your muscles grow, makes your brain stay the right size and the same size. I mean, it works with testosterone, they work together. So generally, testosterone also helps you heal. So generally I look at IGF-1, which is a way of testing growth hormone. And uh, cause growth hormones in your body very briefly and then stimulates IGF-1. So we look at that and then it is usually highest in the morning. So it has to be in the morning when we test it. So that that's a difficulty for blood tests. Then uh, when I look at that and it is low when we start testosterone, it should, the way I treat with pellets, it should jump up by at least 30 points in the first four months for both men and women. So when I test it and it doesn't go anywhere, it can be that the patient lost weight because you can't have a high growth hormone as you're losing fat. It goes back up later, but it could be transient. Or they didn't lose weight and there's, they don't have enough testosterone or they've had a head injury or something's wrong with their pituitary, which means no matter what I do with hormones and with exercise, exercise increases it too, their growth hormone is not going to get better. So you have all these drop down menus in your head like a computer? It just I don't it know. could be this or that or this or that. And I don't know. It just happens. Okay. <laughs> it just happens. I wish I knew how. Yeah, uh, I'd like to do. I'd like to do a program instead. <laughs> I mean, like yeah. a, a computer program. But so that was was that confusing? No, no. So it's just, I'm just growth hormone by how you should track be going up right. when you see the when I see the patient back at four months, and if it's not, I have to figure out why. Right. And if they've and even if they don't remember a head injury, sometimes they've had them, auto accidents, yes. things like that. So um, and as we get older slept upside the head. Sometimes growth hormone in your case, and so and sometimes as we get older, the growth hormone just won't be stimulated. After seventy five, we find that even testosterone doesn't always stimulate growth hormone. So in that case we try exercise first. We try we try testosterone. We try all and we try arginine and ornithine, a supplement that you can take in the morning and at night, and that helps stimulate it. But in the end, if we can't get your your growth hormone to go up, and you're not building muscle and you're not building bone, even with testosterone, then we need to give you something to stimulate growth hormone. It's not growth hormone. Human growth hormone has problems. It works outside of the normal physiologic functions and, and yeah. feedback systems, but this called somoralin doesn't. Somoralin. Somoralin is a stimulator for your um, hypothalamus to your pituitary that's gonna stimulate the so production of growth hormone. So what's already naturally being produced in my body but is beginning to diminish. Right, it just that stimulates the stimulate natural. That to freshen. Right. Okay. And it doesn't make it, and it does not make growth hormone get, get too high. It can't do that because it works within the checks and balance systems. So my forehead in your body. won't grow all the way. Right. Like and your this. jaw won't grow big. Okay. You won't look like a Neanderthal. Neanderthal. Well, that so, was my big worry. Yes, I bet. Yeah. Ah. So, so this is a very safe way to stimulate growth hormone, especially in folks with head injuries or who are over 70, 75 that can't make it themselves. Well, let's get to the last one high okay. cholesterol. Okay, so high cholesterol is very common when I see patients first, and that is because testosterone is made out of cholesterol. And we've talked a little bit about this before, but cholesterol goes up as testosterone starts coming down. As the production in both men and women decreases, the LDL cholesterol, the bad one, and the total go up, and that makes everybody freak out and they get put on statins. Right. Well, testosterone is made of cholesterol. But when the testicles and the ovaries stop making it or decrease the production, then all that cholesterol that used to be made into testosterone just stacks up basically in your okay. bloodstream. So your levels go up. Mm -hmm. But when your testosterone is replaced, 
there's some kind of feedback system in the liver, and I can't give you the name of it, that, that decreases the cholesterol production. It says, we have enough. You don't need to keep producing more. Right. So, uh, so then, you, in general, I see my LDL and total cholesterol in 90% of my patients drop yeah. when we give testosterone. Now, if they drop too low because they're on a statin, then oftentimes they have to ha decrease their dose of statin. Their other doctor, We have to ask their other doctor to do that, or they may not need a statin anymore. So that's always helpful, mm -hmm. and it's something that we watch, but we don't necessarily have to treat it individually. We watch it come down as the testosterone's working. So you track it, and you know what to expect it to do, and if it's not doing that, then you contact the other physician and mm -hmm. say, Okay, there's a disconnect here. So, and they so, may okay. still need statins. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. possible. So, th so, so these are five very common uh, ancillary complications mm -hmm. that people experience as they age, even if they're on testosterone replacement. Right. And so, you, what you, the, the the end message is, you want a physician who knows this, who looks for this, who treats this, or refers it out, so that it doesn't just get ignored. Right. You don't want to wake up someday thinking you're really healthy and you've been taking your testosterone, you've been following a diet and exercise program, and then, oops, you got diabetes. Yeah. Uh, you know, at that point, it's really hard to back up and, and not have diabetes. But when you're pre-diabetic, you can avoid that disease. Right. So we just don't want you to find that you're lulled into a complacency of being healthy and then find out that you've got one of these illnesses that hasn't been addressed or that the testosterone that you're taking, they, they've missed the estrone or the they're keeping you on cholesterol medicine when your cholesterol is low now. I mean, these are things that yeah, they should be they aware of and should be checking and taking care of in the first six months of your therapy. So thank you for listening and be alert. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.